Hi, welcome to Compelling Conversations, where law meets business. I'm Dara Rosenbaum, a founding partner and attorney at Rosenbaum & Taylor in New York. My own journey has shown me the power of learning from others, whether from their successes or from their failures. That's what led me to start this show. In each episode, my goal is to have a compelling conversation with a business leader, business owner, or other inspiring person who will share with you their experiences, their advice, and their perspective. I hope you'll learn from them and be inspired from them, just as I'm sure I will. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. I am thrilled to welcome today Lisa L. Levy. She is the founder and CEO of L Cubed Consulting, a firm that helps organizations elevate through strategic goal, I'm sorry, through strategic goal achievement. She and her team teach the adaptive transportation framework, I'm sorry, transformation framework to savvy business leaders who want to build agility into their operating model to continuously adapt and thrive. She is the number one best-selling author of Future Proofing Cubed and is a frequent guest expert on multimedia outlets and speaker at business executive conferences. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Dara, for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm so, I'm so looking forward to this conversation. So tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you become an entrepreneur? Well, it, it was 2009. I was in my mid to late 30s. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a normal day, but I was in line getting ready to swipe my ticket and get on the roller coaster. And I sat down and when the bar came down, I looked at my hands and I was white knuckling it before anything even started to happen. And then the roller coaster started moving and we're going up and I heard that clunk, chunk, chunk, chunk. And my heart was racing and I knew that we were getting up to the top and I had to take a deep breath before we swooped off into everything and the twists and the turns. I was feeling physically dizzy. Mm -hmm. It's a roller coaster ride. It's supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. And I was nauseated. Mm. I had to take another deep breath and center myself. And I stepped into the CEO's office. He called me in for an early morning meeting and I wasn't quite sure why. The roller coaster is his invention. So I'm just along for the ride. And he ushered me in. He is a brilliant man. He is charming. He's let's own it. He's also really good looking. <laughs> and he greets everybody with the most endearing uh, bear hug. And he sat me down in his office. And this is my dream job. It is a startup company. It is doing amazing things. And they brought me in to standardize their project management practice, build out how they have standard and repeatable processes because growth is happening and scale needed to be possible. And he started talking and I was looking at his face and I was hearing wah, 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 wah. Like the teacher at Charlie Brown. <laughs> Hello, peanuts. And I'm looking at him and he says, things are too hard. Wah, 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 wah. We need to be nimble. We're a startup. Wah, 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 wah. And it went on and on and I'm nodding and, and the conversation ended and I walked out of his office and went, I got to get away from here for a minute. I walked next door to grab a cup of coffee. And I said, hey, do you happen to have, I don't know, a barf bag? The owner of the coffee shop was like, Lisa. <laughs> Took his head, got my coffee, handed it to me, and, and he wandered off. He was just not going to engage. <sighs> I started walking back to the office, and I looked at the building, and it's gorgeous. Glass, brand new. We're in the heart of downtown Tempe, Arizona. The sun is shining. Excuse me. The sun is shining and I see the roller coaster to hell. And I know I can't do it. I cannot go back in that building, not ever. And as I'm standing there looking at it, I think, I got to go. This is my job. This is what provides my security, my 401k, my vacation time. It's my future. A little voice said, why? Why do you have to? I do. I just have to. You're single, you don't have any kids. You have the opportunity and the freedom to do anything. Mm -hmm. I stood there and I looked at that building and a light bulb went off. I can do anything. And in that moment, the idea of L cubed was born. 
the idea that I could take my experience and my knowledge and turn it into a consulting practice that's better than the average consulting practice that cares about the clients and their outcomes mm -hmm. and really gives them the tools to become self-reliant. In a moment, my life changed. And what's the first thing you did toward that, toward that journey other than probably quitting your job with the good looking CEO? <laughs> I, that day I left the office. I, I just, I, I took a personal day and then I had to figure out the plan. I had to figure out how I was going to put it all together and what L cubed was going to be. So it took, it, it, it took thought and it took care, but there were certain things that I knew for free. If I worked with teams to align people, processes, and enable with technology, it's, it's management consulting 101. But if we do those things and we do them well, everything will work. Keep in mind, it was 2009. Mm -hmm. The economy was a mess. Mm -hmm. Everything was out of control. And I always had considered myself to be terribly risk averse. Mm. And in the days and the weeks that followed that moment, I realized that living is a risk. Mm -hmm. And if I were going to be in control and I, let's face it, I wanted to build my own roller coaster and I wanted it to be fun. Mm -hmm. The only way to do that was to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And what, what were the, what were the early challenges in those early days when you, you know, left the security of a 401k and, you know, vac paid vacation time and all of that that comes with the big job and the beautiful glass building? the fear of the unknown, right? Where is the first client going to come from? Where is the second client going to come from? How do I actually make this work? Mm -hmm. I had never owned a business, mm -hmm. right? I know a lot about running businesses, mm -hmm. but actually, right, there are things I had to learn to form the corporation, to do just the basic things that if I had known you then would have <laughs> probably been so much easier, but I stumbled my way through it mm -hmm. and fortunately had been working in the, my field of project management for a number of years mm -hmm. in the same market. So I had a network mm -hmm. and I know nothing about sales. I know nothing about marketing. And I just started talking to people I know and saying, this is what I want to try and accomplish. And business started through referrals mm -hmm. and that carried me forward for eight or nine years to the late you know, 2017 kind of time frame. Mm -hmm. And then what, cha what changed in 2017? The referral stopped. Mm -hmm. And I still don't know that I understand why. There wasn't necessarily a particular reason, but something did change. And that was then a time to reinvent a little bit. And I'll, L cubed 2.0. Uh -huh. um, started out with writing a book and future proofing cubed and taking the business model adaptive transformation that we've developed over the years, which is aligning project management, process performance management, internal controls and organizational change into something that's consumable for businesses that aren't enterprise billion dollar monsters. Uh -huh. Um, their best practices, every business can learn from them, can leverage pieces of them without having to pay big dollars to build big teams or big consultants to mm -hmm. do it for them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Adaptive Transformation Framework is designed uh, to let smaller businesses use those best practices strategically very early on in their growth cycle so that they build it into the corporate DNA and it builds in the capacity to navigate change. Mm -hmm. So the book came out, ultimately was released in May of 2020 mm -hmm. in the midst of chaos mm -hmm. and was there to you know, reassure that there are ways that we can adapt and thrive. They aren't, they aren't it's not a secret sauce. These are best practices used globally, but if we strategically pick the pieces that help tune a specific business, the results follow very quickly. And when you say pick the pieces that tune a specific business, is that industry specific or is that really individualized to, to different companies? It's absolutely individualized to different companies because where every company is at a different place in its own journey. And so... 
you know, starting with a customer journey and understanding might be where we need to start with a business that's trying to figure out if its products and services are meeting their customer needs. Mm -hmm. If a company is trying to grow rapidly, we may need to start with process refinement so that we can standardize so that we can do more faster. Mm -hmm. Every, every story, every client story has its own time and place and how we engage and where we start. What's one of your favorite client stories? Oh, so COVID, March 2020, our world changed. We lived in a vibrant three-dimensional space where we interacted with people face-to-face -face, and there were things like hugs in the world. Yeah. And we ended up here, right, in our little boxes. Mm -hmm. And that was a major shift for many people and many companies. At the beginning of all of this, I was sitting with a team of few dis food distribution executives, and they were trying to figure out what they were going to do and how they were going to weather the first two weeks, because it was really only supposed to be two weeks of a shutdown. Mm -hmm. There are about three dozen faces in boxes. Many of them have never been in a video conference in their life. And CEO, the CEO, Sarah, was looking at all of the, the, the screen, she looked a little disheveled. She wasn't as polished as we're used to seeing her. And she's trying to explain what we're trying to accomplish. And in the middle of it, there's this hand, these hands that are waving frantically. And she looks at the screen. She goes, Brian, you, you need to say something. Brian, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> we all still have that problem. <laughs> Right. It's, it's our reality. And he's like, what? what? Can you hear me now? And everybody nods. And yeah, he goes, all right. I'm standing in the distribution warehouse. I've, I've got 15,000 square feet of consumables. A lot of them are food that's perishable. In two weeks, Sarah, this place is going to stink. And it's a whole <laughs> lot of waste that we need to we, we need to do something. Of course, Brian, that's what we're here to talk about today. Sarah cajoled and explained. He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I have an idea. And she's smiling. She goes, okay, Brian, what's the idea? He goes, we need to get the food to places where people are going to need it. We, our customers have ordered it. We're not going to distribute it to them because their restaurants are shut down. What about food shelters? What about food banks? What, and he just went on with all of these ideas of places where food was going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. And Sarah stopped him and said, Brian... That's brilliant and exactly why we're here today. He said, Sarah, but, but there's more. She goes, Brian, let's just take one piece at a time. I want you to figure out how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Get a team of people, take the next day, figure it out, do it, mm -hmm. and then come back and tell us how it worked. And if it worked, we're going to do it everywhere. We have hundreds of warehouses around the country. Mm -hmm. Get it right once and let's see what happens. I was beaming inside listening to this and watching it happen because this is part of what we do with Elk Cubed. Mm -hmm. We teach our leaders how to build innovation engines, how the value of a three-step process, right? Generating ideas, prototyping them, meaning to play with them a little bit, see what works, see what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Step three, you've got to learn from it and figure out how to move forward. Mm -hmm. Some experiments work, some don't. Sarah and Brian were able to experiment and come up with a way to get food to places that were going to need it in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful to see it happen in real time live. That's, that's very cool. That's very cool. So I like that. And I love the phrase innovation engine, because I think that it really captures the energy required for it and, and the drive that is required. How much do you think the culture of, of Sarah and Brian's company played into the ability for Brian to, you know, wave his hands in the middle of a 30 person, you know, meeting of people in boxes? In normal circumstances that the corporate culture that existed prior to the pandemic mm -hmm. would not have embraced that. Mm -hmm. They were on a journey to change. Mm hmm. And the pandemic forced it to happen fast. Mm -hmm. Sarah was ready for it and was planning for it. And rather than executing to plan, we went with what was happening in real time, day to day, mm -hmm. pivoting with, with the pandemic. The culture today 
is radically different than it was in February of 2020. And it is so much better because that idea of experimentation is at the heart of everything they do. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to assume risk of minor, some people would call them failures. Mm -hmm. I prefer learning moments. Better. <laughs> right? I, failure is, is a stupid word. Mm -hmm. But the learning moments, and mm -hmm. again, experiments don't always give you the outcomes you think you're going to get, but you can learn from those and then move on. And Sarah is doing a fantastic job with her teams. And it sounds like Sarah is the kind of leader who is willing to have the guy standing in the distribution warehouse, you know, one of a hundred distribution warehouses, wave his hands at the meeting and offer a suggestion. Where yes. I think, you know, too many leaders sometimes, um, you know, have that top down, I'll come up with the idea and I'll tell you how to execute it. Absolutely. And so uh, the innovation engine mm -hmm. changes that fundamentally. It requires that you're constantly asking for ideas from your employees, from your customers, from people on the street, mm -hmm. right? It is, it's broadening that up to any input is a good input. Mm -hmm. There are ideas that will never make it to a prototype and will never get tested. Mm -hmm. But I truly believe that the more ideas you get into the pool mm -hmm. and the crazier some of them are, lets you find the ones that are actually brilliant, that are actually going to make the exponential leaps for your business. Hmm. Sarah's example is a large corporation, mm -hmm. but this approach works in a three-person business. It works in a solopreneurship. Mm -hmm. In the solopreneurship, it's a little harder, right? You're the person generating the constant list of ideas, mm -hmm. but you should you know, reach out to people you trust, your advisors, your trusted advisors, your friends, your family, and do these this idea of prototyping and testing because testing it can be a thought exercise. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean building a new product, a new thing. It means just thinking through what it is so that you can describe it, share it, and get feedback. Well, it sounds like it ties back to what you were talking about, how you built L Cubed from 2009 to 2017, where you were reaching out to your network, you were getting referrals mm -hmm. and using all those people as resources. And I mean, it's it's a very, very parallel idea to using those same people as resources when you're in the business and when you need help for, you know, those, like you said, those crazy ideas that just might be brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, I, li I like that. I like that idea very much. I think I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, using the people and resources around you because very few of us are doing things that have never been done before. Somebody's done some version of it and there's something you can learn from. Well, you know, and one of the other things in, in writing the book, I interviewed a lot of um, C-level executives mm -hmm. in different industries and different sized businesses. Mm -hmm. And I learned something that I think that we all know, but actually experiencing it is, is important. Everybody likes to talk about what they know and mm -hmm. what they do and what they love. Mm -hmm. This podcast is another great example, right? Inviting people to have a conversation. Who's going to say no? It's a wonderful time to explore ideas, to share thoughts, see things from a different perspective. Um, everybody's willing to give a little bit of time to help make something better. And I think what it does, what I hope it does, at least what I hope the podcast does, is that it shortens the learning curve for some people. Some people can listen to somebody else's success or somebody else's failure and build on that in some way and apply it to their own lives. That's sort of, that's certainly the goal. It, absolutely. And right, you're getting perspectives from places that you would not necessarily have access to. Mm -hmm. um, prior to us being in this virtual space, right? We would never have, you and I would never have met and learned about what we're doing. Right. I'm in New York and you're in Arizona. <laughs> Absolutely. And so this, this medium uh, opens up that opportunity to break geographic barriers, you know, globally even, and have, um, get thought leadership from places we would not necessarily have had access to. And in terms of L-Cubed, how is it that you work with your clients? So is, it, is this in person? Is it virtual? Is it, you know, webinars? How do, how do you, how do you kind of facilitate all these wonderful things and, and get them to uh, get them to grow that way? We do everything. Um, prior to the pandemic, we did a lot of on-site work. Um, always knew that we could do things virtually and that it would be 
very similar in an experience. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say it's the exact same. Mm -hmm. And there's value to in-person time. And there's when we're doing deep thinking work, right? Imagine the conference room with you know sticky notes all over the walls and you know, and how you have that interaction of thinking in a group. Mm -hmm. You can get really close virtually, but sometimes we, I still like to be in person, but we do 90% of the work we're doing today is virtual. Okay. And the engagements that you have with your clients, are they long-term, you know, they start with you and then they kind of grow with you, or is it more of a, of a crisis situation where you go in because they're having an acute problem? We, we play in different spaces. So we definitely have done a, a lot of acute problem work over the years. Uh, we try to do short-term engagements with a very specific outcome, 90 days, solve for that outcome. Mm -hmm. And then we can grow to another outcome and another outcome. But one of the things I despise about the traditional consulting model is the desire, what I call, to land and expand. And the whole goal is to get a resource in, get three resources in, get 10 resources in, and never have them leave. Mm. And that is absolutely not what we try to do. We want to build the skills and capabilities so that over time, the business can do all of these things for themselves. It and is, then we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, and then we can advise, right? We can be in a very different role and we can, we can coach, we can course correct, but they can do the work. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting business model to make it essentially so that your clients don't need you as much. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think that that's really the heart and soul of what consulting was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. And it's just been lost along the way. I think that the business models have certainly, have certainly evolved to that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, obviously it's been quite a journey from the, you know, the white knuckle before you walked into the big glass building to obviously where you are today. What's something that you've learned along the way that you wish you'd known earlier? Taking a risk is fun. Hmm. Um, embracing the unknown and, and, and kind of working on, through the fear, through the uncertainty is exhilarating. Hmm. And then it doesn't, you know, appeal, I'm sure to everybody. And I did not appeal to me in 2008, 2009, but once I did it, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. It was, it was freeing. And it doesn't have to be, from my perspective, it doesn't have to be a risk as big as you took. No. It can be a smaller risk with, you know, within a company or a smaller risk with a side business or something. If you're not feeling like, you know, build, like you said, building your own roller coaster. Absolutely. And we do take little risks every day, right? Do I, do I cross the street against the crosswalk, right? That's a risk. <laughs> um, you know, what our tolerances are, every person's is different, right? But being able to just every now and then do something that's uncomfortable helps us grow. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be to somebody who is, you know, standing in that coffee shop looking for a barf bag from the uh, from the owner because they just can't stomach the idea of walking back in and listening to wah, wah, wah? Oh, well, my first piece of advice is come up with a plan, have a general idea of what your experiment might be. Mm -hmm. And to a point you just made Dara, Dara, sorry, do an experiment first. You don't have to like jump off the cliff mm -hmm. in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, take, take little incremental experiments and learn and grow uh, so that you have some confidence in making a major shift. Mm -hmm. But getting the practice of experimenting, everything is an experiment. I do. My family is just tired of hearing that from me. Sure, let's try it. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like you said, from from that comes great things. Mm -hmm. Lisa, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I'm really, I really enjoy this. I wish we could go on forever. Can you tell the audience how they can find you? The fastest, easiest way to find me is Lisa Levy.com. Um, it, it's how you can find me full name on LinkedIn and I have your easy access to me for phone conversations from those sources. Perfect. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this. This has certainly been a compelling conversation.